set you ring in me again. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky, from my world we can. Oh, 
You're the God of this city You're the King of this people You're the Lord of this nation You are You're the light in this darkness You're the hope to the hopeless You're the peace to the So it's day 12 on the wall, and last night was my battle with pitch 15, my third day of projecting pitch 15. And I rested for two days in order to heal my index finger enough to climb without tape. And it was the best I've ever felt on the pitch, but unfortunately I still didn't do it. And I'm not going to lie, I was pretty, pretty devastated and you know, thoughts crossed my mind that I should just throw in the towel and support Tommy to the top because he's through all the hard parts. Um, but then I thought about how much time I've put into this so far, and it's been six years and hundreds of days, and what's a few more rest days? We're fully stocked up here if it means finishing the project. So I'm spending today, day 12, and tomorrow, day 13, resting. And day 14 is going to be cloudy. It's going to be the coldest day in the forecast. And I am confident that I'm going to put it down and move on to the dyno pitch and go catch up with Tommy and top this thing out. So that's the latest. Um, I really want to do this thing. The crux of pitch 15 has the sharpest holds on the entire route, for sure. And the crux is characterized by getting into a total iron cross position. I'm fully extended tip to tip as far as my wingspan goes. 
And from there, it takes 14 little micro hand and foot moves in order to get across that face. So there's a lot of opportunities to lose tension, to misstep a foothold, and it's some of the most precarious climbing I've ever done. Um, so I think that's what's making the red point of this pitch so challenging, is it's really just the character of the, that crux sequence. It's not just power, it's not just finger strength. You know, everything has to click and everything has to be done absolutely perfectly. And I'm just waiting for that perfect moment to come along. Hi everyone, at CIC, uh, we're continuing on with a series called The Dawn Wall, but before I begin, I have a couple of announcements to share with you. Uh, first of all, we'll be having our communion on next Sunday, so what we'd like to invite you to do is actually, if you could prepare just, uh, since we're going to do, to do it like family style in your home, if you could prepare a little grape juice and maybe a little bread, uh, depending on you know, how many family members you have. So we'll kind of walk through the communion on next Sunday. So if you could join us online and we'll have a time of communion together at the end of the service. One additional announcement I do have is that recently, uh, related to COVID-19, there's been a lot of small businesses and, and families that are having some hardship and uh, there's a church member or several members who have uh, gave, who have donated some funds for the church. So if you know anyone in our church community or even outside of our church family that is in dire need uh, of some support, it may not be a huge financial uh, support, but if they could use some help, uh, there should be Sonny Kim's number that you'll find uh, on the screen. And if you can call Sonny or text him uh, to this number, we'll try to make ends meet somehow. So just keep that in mind and uh, we'll continue with that. Uh, do you ever sense the urge to move in the direction that feels unnatural or uncomfortable to you? Sort of like turning the other cheek or going the extra mile that Jesus asked. I mean, who'd want to do that, right? I mean, you'd have to be like almost out of your mind to do that. Or, you know, maybe you feel like you're supposed to go north, but sometimes it feels as though God is asking you to actually go south, move in a completely different, opposite direction. And we feel confused in those moments. We feel lost. We don't know what to do. But there are moments like that in our lives, isn't there? You know, I, I one time was, you know, like a lot of men wrestle with this from time to time when like maybe at a, some public place or in front of a, a bathroom, let's say, right? And, and, and my wife one time was like in a hurry, she's in a rush to you know, go inside, go to this lady's room. And she would ask me, you know, could you hold this purse for me just for a sec while I use the bathroom? And what do you do in that moment? You know, because in that moment, you actually have to make a very quick decision. Am I going to like, like, like take my man card out and say, oh man, I can't do that. You're asking me to do something that silly. I can't do that. And refuse your wife's suggestion or, or what she's asking you to do. Are you going to really do that? Take that option? Or, or even though, you know, when she was asking me to do that, I mean, her purse didn't exactly match my, the outfit I was wearing, but would you be willing to hold on that purse in front of that lady's room when, when you don't even know how long you're going to be standing in front of that lady's room? But you have to make that choice. Sometimes the choices we make may seem totally uncomfortable, but you have to take that route from time to time, right? Uh, I heard the story one time that Sonny shares, and you may have heard this too, but he and I have one thing in common, which is that we both, uh, when we didn't know each other, but at one point in time, we both used to be on a track team at school. Maybe for Sonny, this was a middle school or high school, or I don't know. For me, I was in elementary school. But he said when he was on track team, his coach would, you know, first day, I think, of training, he would make, you know, all these you know, track team members go in circles and, you know, run, you know, in the field. And they were, I don't know how many circles they exactly had to make on the field. But after they were done with their practice, 
you know, they called the guy, the coach called Sonny and says, you know, I don't like the attitude, the spirit with which you were, you know, running. So I guess, I don't know about other people, other guys on the team, but he specifically called out Sonny and asked him to, you know, run again, run some more, you know, because he didn't like the way he was running. So I heard that Sonny started running, 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 and he ran straight home. Isn't that a great story? So he, that was his first and last day of being on the track team, something like that. But a lot of times we're, we're running our course and then somebody's asking us to go in this direction. And maybe it's God, maybe it's coach, maybe it's our parents, maybe it's our mentor. But we don't want to go in that direction. We don't want to move in that direction because it doesn't seem to make sense in that moment. We feel lost and we feel confused. And then as Christ followers, there's a choice again in that moment we have to make. I, I may feel like going in this direction because that feels more comfortable to me. That feels more familiar for me. But God sometimes asks us to go in this direction instead, even though we may not fully understand and comprehend what God is trying to ask us to do. In 1 Samuel 20, uh, I mean, it's a story of David, and you're familiar with this passage, but I'm not going to read the passage in its entirety. But the passage I wanted to share was from 1 Samuel 20, verses 31 through 42. And the story here basically is where, where uh, David's closest friend, Jonathan, right? Uh, Jonathan is actually next heir in line to be the king. And the crazy thing is, he, he refuses this offer or this plan that his father Saul had in mind. He says, no thank you to being the next kin, king, next you know, heir of the throne. Instead, he feels David is the right person. I mean, can you imagine? And this is exactly what's going on in 1 Samuel chapter 20. And I just want to share one verse, which is verse 31, and it says this. This is Saul speaking. As long as the son of Jesse, this is David, right? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you, that's Jonathan, right? Neither you or your kingdom will be established. Now send and bring him to me. Bring David to me, for he must die. So Saul's plan is obvious here. He wants David out of the picture completely. Why? So his son, Jonathan, can rule in his place. Now, if you've been following, with, following me with this movie called The Dawn Wall, again, if you haven't watched the movie yet, I invite you to uh, watch the movie. But Tommy's been climbing with his friend Kevin for, for like six years now. I mean, that's a long time as professional climbers. They, they've been climbing this, for this long. Imagine how tight their friendship would have been. This is their collective dream. The goal is very clear. It's precise. The goal is none other than climbing the dawn wall together and making it to the top successfully. Obviously without falling, without killing themselves, right? The problem is they keep running into trouble over and over and over and over again because Basically, the trouble is what? Tommy made it. He almost made it way to the top. But his friend Kevin keeps on falling short. He goes up. Looks like he's going to make it. But he falls. And he tries again. Looks like he's going to make it. He drops again. Looks like he's going to make it. He tries again and again and again. So they stay on this wall, actually, literally for 20 days. They sleep on the wall, 20 days. They eat on the wall. 20 days? Can you imagine? No outside communication is possible. It's just these two guys, Tommy and Kevin, all the way up, almost on top of this dawn wall at Yosemite National Park. It's crazy, isn't it? Do you ever have some occasion when you run into trouble, when you run into a problem that seems unsolvable, at least in the here and now. Things not turning out the way you had planned or expected. I mean, we all have those moments, right? When everything seems to be going south. 
I mean, we meet twists and turns and bumps that we don't really expect to see. And obviously, some are more challenging and more difficult. Some are longer lasting. Some are just downright painful. Well, Tommy and Kevin are slammed into a situation like that. Basically, they've hit the wall. I mean, you've heard the expression, you know, like runner's wall or writer's block, right? It's much like that, except it was just going on and on and on. They actually stay on the wall for that length of time. And just, they want to make it, but they just quite can't make it together. But you know, how can you just wait? I mean, it's one thing to have confidence in your friend or partner, but it's another to just go on when your friend is making the same mistake over and over again. However, that's the crazy thing about this movie. And that's the crazy thing about Tommy. Because Tommy decides to wait. Who for who? For his friend Kevin. Because he didn't want to make it to the top by himself. So he chooses to wait it out for his friend. You know what Tommy actually says? He says this. I want Kevin to be able to experience what I have. That's it. That's his only motivation. I want him, my partner, my friend, Kevin, to be able to go to the top and have that mountaintop experience that I've experienced. I want him to experience this too. I want his dream to become part of my dream. He goes on to say, it's important that I make it to the top successfully, but that's not the most important thing. I don't see any magic in that. I don't see any virtue in that. I don't see any glory in that because I want my friend to be able to make it to the top as well. I want to see that happen. So what does Tommy do? He does this real strange and dangerous thing called down climbing. I guess it's an expression that actually exists in the professional rock climbing world. I've never heard of such an expression, but, but it's true. I mean, it's as hardcore as it gets. Because if you've watched this movie, I mean, you know how tall this rock is, right? It's almost straight, right? And, and what is down climbing? I mean, literally, that's what it is. You go up, almost to the top, and you go back down. He's doing this. Tommy's doing this. Why? Because he didn't want to go alone. He didn't want to make it to the top alone. He could have. He was almost there. But he decides to do what? Down climbing. It's crazy, isn't it? When he came back to where Kevin was, guess what he says to Kevin? I'm going to do everything I can to help you make it to the top. That's it. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have a partner like that? Or do you have a spouse like that? If you do, that's just amazing, right? When other people watch Tommy from the bottom, they couldn't understand. And some people were watching this whole process on the screen. But logically, it just didn't make sense. I mean, I, I get it. They were pretty tight, right? I get that. But come on, what if your friend never makes it? What if he never succeeds? You're going to wait 30 days, 40 days, 50 days, 100 days? Come on. Who wants to do that? But Tommy chose to do that. It could have messed up your career. It could have messed up. It could have ruined Tommy's career. He didn't care. But you know what Tommy's dad says later on in this movie about Tommy, his son's decision? He says, it would not be Tommy if he didn't do that. That's just who he is. It would be weird if he chose anything else. That's what my son is like. This is really what we learn from the life of Jesus, isn't it? Because he came down from heaven. He did what? He did down climbing. He came all the way down to earth. He came in human form so that he can relate and connect with us physically, emotionally, spiritually. The whole shebang. That's just who Jesus is. That's who he is. Jesus did down climbing for the likes of you and me. The story, the story in 1 Sam 20 is about David and Jonathan, right? I mean, it's crazy how Jonathan cares so much about his friend David. Actually, he has every right to stand up to be the next king, but he wants his friend to become the king instead because he feels David's a better candidate. Does that sound crazy or what? Is he dumb? Is he stupid? I don't think so. It may look pretty crazy to the onlookers, but to Jonathan, it just made sense. 
He didn't seek the glory that was available to him. Instead, he gave it up. He gave it up. Does it remind you of anyone? Jesus, right? He gave it up. He gave up his rights. He gave up his power. He gave up his glory and his life and everything for the likes of you and me. Jesus went to the opposite direction. He went in the opposite direction. He downclined. He didn't follow common sense. Actually, Jesus followed uncommon sense. Because that's the life of God. The life that God was calling him to live. And that's exactly the life that God is calling us to live as well, isn't it? What kind of life? The life of down climbing. Remember how Jesus turns water in the, into wine at the wedding in Ghana? It was crazy. It was crazy. Absolutely crazy. Now at the wedding, there were beneficiaries of the miracle that Jesus performed, right? Who were the beneficiaries? They were the people, the guests, that were invited for this wedding. And they were feasting and they were drinking. And they, although they didn't actually witness the miracle happen firsthand, they were the beneficiaries of it because water turned into wine and they were able to drink that wine that was supposed to be amazing, right? But you know who actually experienced the miracle firsthand? It wasn't the wedding guests who were invited. It wasn't the you know, people who, or the couple that got married that day because they didn't even know. They didn't see the whole process. They didn't know where the wine came from. They didn't know what kind of wine it was. They, they missed out. They all missed out. But who knew? Who watched firsthand? Who experienced that miracle? They were the servants. I don't think servants even got to taste the wine because they were just servants. They were supposed to deliver the wine and the food and the drinks. But they witnessed a miracle because they saw what happened before their very eyes. Water turning into wine. And we can live two different lives. Two different lives are possible. We can just be beneficiaries of a miracle that, that takes place. Or we can actually be partners with God and seeing and experiencing a miracle that actually takes place through our lives. That's way different, isn't it? I know which one I want to be a part of. I want to be in the process of a miracle taking place right before my eyes. I don't want to just simply be a beneficiary of a miracle. I don't care about the wine. I don't need to drink that wine. I don't need to taste that wine. As, as amazing it might be. But you know what I want to do? I want to witness. I want to see the miracle that God is performing through me. And that's the life that God calls us to. And that's the life that I would love to invite you to live. Experiencing a miracle from day to day as we partner with God and see what Jesus is doing in our lives. Even though in this moment, we may not be able to see, see things clearly, but that's the life to which God invites us. I'd much rather be an instrument of God's miracle, wouldn't you? I'd rather experience it firsthand than just simply being a beneficiary of you, wouldn't you? I think that's a higher calling. May our lives be instruments of grace in the here and now, watching God perform miracles through us, so that His grace would flow through us, so that His love would flow through us and our church. God bless you. Let's pray together, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, I may not be able to taste that amazing wine, but I'd much rather experience and be a part of God's miracle, the miracle that you are performing that you want to perform in our lives this very day. God, help us to be reminded of the work that you continue to do and that you engage with us. And we are so, help us to be grateful for that, how you engage and you invite each and every single one of us into your presence. And, and you don't want us to just be, just be beneficiaries of, of miracles that you perform each and every day, but you want us to actually do and actually to be in the right in the middle, at the center of the miracles that you perform in our society, in our world, in our church, in our family, and in our lives today. Thank you, God. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.